Hello there, my name's Phil Williams and I would like to welcome you to Audio Angling, the podcast site of fishingfilmsandfacts.co.uk. Tony Kirridge, owner of Tony's Tackle at Eastbourne, who I'm linking up with here at the shop, has been involved in a lot of firsts over the years right across the entire angling scene. Sometimes it's been following trends, on other occasions setting them. So a long and very interesting career as an angler and as a tackle dealer, both of which can tell us much about the changes that have shaped angling over the years. Now last time I saw you, we were both propping up a bar on Mauritius, waiting for Cyclone Bella to start ripping the place to pieces, hoping that things might settle out quickly enough to grab a few days on the Marlin before boarding the plane for home. Yeah, I think it was 1991, but anyway, I was quite young then. I didn't get a Marlin, I was quite upset, because some people did, but it was quite tough. But I had a 98-pound sailfish, which was really nice. And they put it up on the board out there because it's quite a big for a selfish, that is, you know. And I ended up, second to last day before the storm, I did get a mile in £157. But I was struggling, I thought, oh, I'm the only one who's not going to get one here, you know. But I caught that on Challenger 3, I recollect. Um, he's a good skipper, the kiddie, the selfish. And it was a good fish, you know what I mean? The main thing was what I remember of it, Phil, is um, I was on the back of the boat and it was dead still and boiling hot and he put live baits out, two bonitos, and this selfish hit this live bait, and I'll tell you what, if you'd have had a camera and got what I see, you'd have been a millionaire, because this fish came out of the water, straight out, upwards, vertical, and it was like a picture, you know, it was no less than 15 yards away, the sea was like a sheet of glass, and this thing was like a picture in front of you, if you could have took a photograph of that when it came out of the water, you'd just made a fortune, but people have painted them like it quite often, you know. That was something else that was, you know, and it was a good trip. It was with Graham, if I reckon, it, with Norman Message come and me, and it was good, we had a real good time, you know, apart from the uh, cyclone, which uh, everyone had to be a bit careful, didn't they? But if I remember it flattened the island, Rodriguez, but they reckon it was coming towards us pretty seriously, but we got the outskirts of it, but it was still bad. Right, with so much here to potentially talk about, it might make sense to split the interview into two parts. The tackle side of things, and later, the practical fishing. Let's start with the tackle trade side and see what that can tell us about angling trends over the past 40 years. Back in the days before internet selling, you took out pioneering multi-page advertising spreads in magazines like Sea Angler, offering discounted mail-order fishing tackle to the masses. At first, we were pioneers of tackle that was exclusive to people we earned good money and we made products ourselves that people bought like rig wallets we we done them for other shops we were pioneers of a lot of things you know um, the real conversions we used to do them all years ago they all had level wines and we pioneered a lot of the bars to take out the level wine to make sure it was all you know you could turn it into a ct version and we used to sell hundreds of these conversions and we knew enough made our own price so we made lots of money and everything was going along lovely and then Dave Docker had come along and he kind of copied us and uh, he done very well out of it and then in the end it, um, I mean we was taking £5,000 a month adverts you know it was incredible we was having four or five page adverts in Sea Angler but it was just all getting a bit too tough and uh, we weren't making quite so much profit so we are still doing okay and then we decided to branch into the carp side because we were doing very well and I think that was one of my mistakes. I mean, unfortunately, it enhanced the turnover. I mean, we, we end up with turnover over 1.3 million. And if you see the size of my shop, it's amazing, really. I mean, there was lorries coming here all day long, picking up stuff and just delivering every day. And we'd done brilliant. But unfortunately, what it was, I was the angler's friend, not making enough money. And then, uh, of course, a few years later, along come the internet and totally messed us up because we was then just buying money, really. We was working shows, we was just turnover, turnover, which is for vanity, as you know, and uh, profit sanity, as you know, and I've realised that now. But at the time, we were just trying to keep everything going, you know, and we did marvellous. But unfortunately, with the recession, the banks got a bit harsh, everything tied up. And then, of course, I started getting into trouble. And... Uh, because I wasn't limited, you see, so we had this turnover of 1.2 million plus, but it's, it was all about um, cash flow, and then because I wasn't limited, we couldn't get out of it, really, and 
basically I'm sitting target waiting to go bankrupt you know and I kept trying to pay people I got court letters all kinds of problems and I was trying to pay people and people you know like people are evil once you're down they put you down don't they and uh, I just kept going and going and I thought well I've four years ago I think it was I thought I've had it now I just can't go on any longer you know and they had a plan where they'd take my house which is worth over 500,000 and I thought well, shall I or not and I thought no I'm not going to I'm going to keep going because I owed about a quarter of a million pound and I paid it all back and uh, I think it got down to the last few things I think one of the last things was nothing to do with fishing tackle it was a burger alarm and the burger alarm bill was 300 pound which turned into something like 1700 pound and they said they were going to come down and take everything out of my shop the next day and all this and oh, it was just getting really bad and I remember I was over the angling club at Eastbourne and uh, I was on this, uh, they do a thing called open the box and I, I never really went in it and I put two quid on it anyway I, I opened this key at the box and cut a long story short I won £3,800 anyway all the guys up there didn't know a lot about it and they were like oh I expect you're going to buy your wife a new car and all this and all that and do you know what that three and a half grand it shows you how sometimes it's better to be lucky than rich that three and a half grand just was enough to pay off all the little bills I had left and start again and now I've spent four years and I'm almost like pay as you go now like a telephone and my shop's full of gear I must have eighty thousand pounds of stuff in here now it's all paid for I don't owe anyone any money and it's like a fresh start so I'm so glad that I survived really but I'll tell you, it, it was the internet that would dumb me in because everyone was just quoting internet prices to me and all they wanted to do was kind of just hit me with internet prices or match me with Jerry's or match me with Eels and I basically just had to do it, either wrap it up and sell it or not. But I blame some of the companies, Phil. People like Daiwa, they don't really care that you get these reels called Baziers and I, I remember I was wrapping up three Baziers for carp fishing. I had to match a price of about at the time I think it was something like £900 and basically I'd wrap these reels up close my eyes and think oh it's £900 in the, in the till and I was making about 12 quid. and it was like what do I do, do I just turn this money away or take it and they made the market like that really because you know nowadays I deal with companies that I buy something and I sell it at the right price and if I don't I don't buy it but in the old days Daiwa and not just Daiwa Shimano as well everyone got in such a price war because what they were doing was underhanded deals to some people around the corner not telling you and you think how can they do that and they go oh, I don't know they can't but of course they were <laughs> so that's business I suppose but unfortunately that was happening I mean all, of course I got a good few deals on the way but I think sometimes you get into a state where you buy so much gear if you can't move it fast enough you're not making the profit so you may as well have bought one of them you with me and I've learned that over the years and now I, if someone goes too shy of me on the price I will turn around and say no and it's took me a long time to do that but I realise now that if I don't I'm not going to be here you know so but it was quite good the, the climbing back was good Graham Pullen helped me he don't realise how much he helped me really I was talking to him the other week and he just came down and said oh, I'll do a video for you like he always done and uh, he done these couple of videos one on the Eastbourne Pier and he done another one for me on long casting and another one on beach fishing tips and they're phenomenal I mean I get people I used to spend five thousand pound a month advertising to get people to come here and they come from miles you know and now people are drifting in again and they're going I've seen you on the DVD I've I've been watching it's really good I think I've sort of slowly got a new life of it starting to happen again obviously not on the scale of what was happening with the mags because obviously I was massive you know what I mean but I feel stick, I think as well though I've got a bit of stick from people I still kept my name I didn't go bankrupt as some people reported which was really bad and I kept myself going and now I, I kind of I'm semi-retired now I love it I come in here do a few deals have a week off if I want and everything's not too severe like the tackle trade, angling generally has also seen its ups and downs reflecting changes in such variables as disposable incomes, fish stocks and interest levels. Sticking with the sea angling side of things for the moment, declining fish stocks, the failure to bring in new blood and a growing acceptance of smaller sizes and species which anglers were previously not interested in have to be immediate causes for concern. Presumably, tackle sales will also reflect these changes. 
So from a tackle dealing perspective, how has sea angling changed over your time in the business? One of the big things, I suppose, was uptiding. John Raw, I think, back in the 60s or 70s, 70s, I think, he came up with uptiding. And uh, I used to know John, and massive thing, uptiding. You know, I mean, the amount of fish you catch more than, than fishing out of the back of a boat. What I've noticed, the biggest thing around here, is that if I get a Pen 330 GTI, or let's just say a Pen 40 real Senator or something, which was a popular reel, wasn't it, years ago, I can't begin to sell it. I've got no chance. Everybody now, because they use braid and they use lighter line, one of the biggest reels used in the boat is at just just slightly bigger than a 7000 size. No one needs to buy massive great big rods anymore. I mean they've got their place for conger in and a big reel, of course a TLD 25, but people don't want them anymore. They want a small reel, they put something like 30 pound braid on it, because we get a lot of tide out of Eastbourne, quite often you have to use two pound of lead. And instead of using two pound of lead you can use three quarters of a pound, half a pound quite comfortably, so your bite's better. Generally catch more fish because you can feel the bottom if you're drifting. It's just a revelation, braid really, I think it's one of the greatest things ever, especially for competition fishing in a boat. I mean when you're fishing for bigger fish I, I think nylon's better because you've got a bit of stretch, you know, and if I was going congrid I'd probably use nylon. But when you fish with this braid general fishing you can feel the rocks, you can feel the bottom, you can feel everything and you see your bites and you know that if a couple of small fish are on there they're on there we can fish out of here with the big tides out of Eastbourne and you might have a couple of dogfish on there and you wouldn't even know they're on there because it's ripping so hard the tide you have one little bite you might think oh have I got it or not you leave it down there 10 minutes you reel up and you've got two dogfish and you think how long they've been on there you know whereas with the braid you know instantly whether you've got something on and just can deal with everything better you know and I think braid's the biggest revelation in beach fishing and boat fishing. I mean they use 10 pound braid on the beach on the fixed balls now and I mean 10 pound braid it's incredible isn't it? It's like 3 pound line. What about individual companies that have stood out above the rest as trendsetters? What like breakaway and stuff like that? Very much so. I think the best thing ever made ever is an impact lead. They're just marvellous you know they're the biggest revelation in angling. You've got an impact lead which you can clip everything down and even if you're not any good at casting, it'll always come off. And you can basically get a guy who can only cast 30 yards or 40 yards even, and he'll get 50. Because he'll have it all clipped down, and it just stops all that wind resistance. And they're probably the best thing ever invented. The other thing that's massive is snood lengths. In, everyone uses amnesia now, and it's a commonplace thing. Well, I think my friend Jock Gowdy up in Norfolk invented that amnesia him and Tony Gittins and they came down to me uh, fishing a big comp and they showed it to me and they said don't tell anyone and cook to me <laughs> so slowly I started getting in the shop and selling it and I think I was one of the first shops to sell it competitively and I used to sell boxes and boxes of it but now it's just an everyday thing you walk in a shop and they sell amnesia on the wall alongside the grease weasel and it's there grease weasel shop leader goes with the amnesia it's in every shop you go in and amnesia is just so nice to use because it's totally memory free, you know. So you get a decent fish, you can just run your hands on it, straighten it out and get another one. But same with like, I mean the next revelation really is fluorocarbon. But I've got to be honest with you, fluorocarbon is a very grey area. It's fantastic, certain conditions as you know, other conditions it's not. But generally fluorocarbon is perhaps more advanced than amnesia. And it can be absolutely brilliant for bass fishing and stuff like that. So it moves on, but how far can it go? You know, you used to use red gills on boat fishing and everything. Well, you never use a red gill now. It's all sidewinders, which you're obviously familiar with, and they're the business, you know what I mean? You just put a sidewinder on, small one or medium one. The only thing I found with the sidewinders is there's a lot of different ones. You've got the quality ones from Sidewinder itself, David Kiddy. Uh, you've got a lot of cheap ones out there you can buy at 2 and people think, oh, I'm getting them 2 99 But believe me, Phil, they fall apart. And I've just done my own sidewinders, C-Match ones, because I own the company C-Match, who owned it for 30 years. And the first thing I made sure is they came through, I got the quality right, they're the same quality as the real sidewinders, and he used them on a boat out here, Deep Blue, quite often, and they all told me they've been using them regularly off me, and they all said they're one of the best ones. They 
they catch a lot of these cod, they don't split, they don't fall apart. People are realising now not to walk in and just buy a sidewinder off the wall at 2 99 They're thinking, hang on a minute, let's have a look at the quality of these. And they're either buying the real sidewinders or something like my C-match ones. And it's very hard to explain that because the average guy who walks through a shop, he'll always pick the 2 99 ones up, but they're mine about six pounds. But what I've done, I've put them together now and I'd, before he takes them, I tell him. And every time you, you'll see blokes where we'll go for the better ones, you know. Another thing is the big difference between feathers, hawk eyes, tinsels. Feathers are a bit of a thing of the past, isn't they? No one really realised, but they've drifted away, haven't they? And you've now got sort of like hawk eyes, silver shrimps, sabiki lures. Everything's more advanced now than it used to be, isn't it? But it needs to be to make up for the fact that we're looking at fewer fish these days. Fewer fish, I think you've got to be more cleverer and more advanced to get them. And if you don't move with the times, you won't catch fish, simple as that. But it, it has seen a big change. I mean, I've been, I've been at the shop 40 years this year. I think I've been 74. And uh, nearly 50 years fishing since I was 12. And oh, I used to go down the beach here, and unfortunately I was too young, but my brother-in-law caught massive cod on the beach, Norman, massive. I couldn't cast, I was sort of 10, 11 years old. You didn't have to cast miles, but you had to cast far enough, if you know what I mean. And of course I was a kid and couldn't get out there. So basically he caught all these massive cod down there. When I had one this year, 15 pound, 14 pound, 14 ounce on the beach. And that's the best one I've had for years. And yet, Norman was catching them every night when I was a kid and I was horrified how big they were, you know, and he got up to 25 pound. And no one took any notice, but you're talking about, what, nearly 50 years ago now, it's a long time, isn't it? Is tackle development driven by changing circumstances, such as fewer fish, and anglers wanting to get more out of individual fish, in terms of encouraging companies to come up with new ideas and create new trends, or is it the other way around, with manufacturers and retail outlets like yourself providing anglers with what they feel they either want or need? I definitely think we follow America with everything we do, and you see shops now and they're full of lures, and I'm not saying it don't work, because it does work but they've literally drummed it into England, the Americans, lure fishing, lure fishing. There's more lure fishing done than anything now. And of course you are gonna catch fish if everyone's doing it, but it just makes you wonder, doesn't it, how uh, things get into trends. They, they start pushing all these lures, rapalas and everything. And I've used them, they're marvelous. You know, I go abroad in Gambia, they're marvelous, but it's a little bit more intricate here. And I don't think it's quite as easy as everyone makes out, you know, and everyone goes, yeah, yeah, you wanna get a load of lures and do this. Well, I sell blokes spinning rods and lure rods and how are you getting on it? What you had? Oh, I had a bass last month. And you're like, yeah, okay. So if I'd have spent two months up the rocks there, I'd have had about 14 bass. So it's great fishing, don't get me wrong, I'm not knocking it. But I think sometimes you get into these trends that people make up and you tend to follow the trend and it ain't always the way to go. Taking that one stage further, what do you make of this LRF with tiny lures from many species in harbours and around rocks? What's that all about? That's what I was saying, you know, I think it's very good, don't get me wrong, and, and very enjoyable. But I, I don't know that everyone gets as big a results as they make out. But then again, certain areas they do, don't they? Lure fishing ain't in all over the country. It's certain places, probably brilliant down in Devon, down that area and around sort of Wales and all that, but Eastbourne's it's not fantastic, you know, I'm not saying you don't catch them, but there's more fish caught around this area probably conventionally on peeler crab and lug and whatever. But it's, it's a lovely thing because some blokes get right into it, they spend a lot of money, they buy lovely spinning rods, 200 quid a rod some of them, and all the gear to go with them and that's what they want to do, so it's everyone's choice really, isn't it? And Eastbourne Pier's on fire, so... They've sent about 30 fire engine stuff, it's all on Sky Sports News and BBC News and everything. But uh, that's not good really. Sounds like another Victorian pier about to be lost to Anglin, which is sad. Right, I've started hearing a lot in recent times about Italian rods. You yourself mentioned the 15 foot beach casters they're now producing. And recently, Scottish Boat International Steve Souter was singing the praises of similar sized telescopic rods as a must for certain aspects of offshore match work. What is it then about Italian tackle design? What's happened to the British innovators such as Ziplex, Coniflex and the like? 
I don't know if anyone wants to have a look, but if you look on YouTube to Graham's latest video with me on the Smooth Hounds, I'm featuring the uh, 07, which is the latest rod. Admittedly, it's £450 to buy, but it, it's a piece of kit. I've been here 40 years, right, and I've never picked a beach rod up like it. It's almost like a feeder rod for fresh water. The tip is about half a mil, and it's just ridiculous. You pick it up, it weighs nothing. It's 15 foot long, and of course, it's a pleasure to use, you know. And I, when I first caught sight of one, I thought, I can't believe this rod. It, I've fished with some rods in my life, but I've never seen any like it. The only thing it lacks, I was talking to Francesco Carenti, who he's their new marketing manager in Colmic in Italy. I was talking to him this morning. And when you reel in, the tip is so fine, you tend to think it's going to break. It doesn't. So I said to him, you know, why can't you put a stiffer tip in it for Dungeon S? Because that's the only thing I can fault on it. It's a marvellous rod. And let's be honest, it's made for the Mediterranean. But it's become big over in England. Everyone's buying them. And what you'll find is guys that can't cast very well, they're picking up one of these Colmic, well, any of these Colmic rods, light 15 footers. They're putting a fixed spool on their surf blaster or something like that. Ten pound braid, ten pound fire line, and they use tapered leaders. And they just, well, you just hit it, and you think. I mean, the first time I cast one, I said to my mate, "You should have a go." I said, "Oh, I'm really sorry. I've cracked it off. I, I feel awful." He said, "What?" I said, "It's gone, isn't it?" And I looked down at the reel, Phil, and it's going, ch -ch 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 -ch. and it, it's still going. It, you know, it's just hit the ground. And I thought I'd cracked it off and it had gone. And he said, no, look, it's still going. It's just flicking off there, you know, little bits, as it's just hit the water. And I was just shocked, you know, it's so easy to cast. Obviously the big boys who use the big ziplexes and that, they've slightly got the edge. I've got two rods. I've got one for pendulum and one for normal fishing, the lighter fishing, the coal meat. But there's not much in it. And it's becoming that, guys, when we fish a match now with 50 anglers in them, before, it was out of the 50, without being rude or nasty, detrimental to anyone, there was probably about 25 who were going to win it, you with me? And you thought, well, one of them 25 is going to win. Well, now, when you get 50 anglers in a match, any one of them 50 can win it, because they've all got long rods, they've all got light line, fixed balls, and they find it easy to cast, and you do it the big pendulum cast, you look round, they just pop it overhead, and they're about seven yards behind you. So. It's a big leveller, you know? <laughs> I've got guys of 70 who've given up fishing, match fishing, and now they've come back and they've started again. Because it's so easy, you know, we did a tuition a couple of months ago and we showed people how to cast them. And some of these guys who bought my fish are 70 years old going, I'll give it to them first time, there's the rod, there's the reel, where you go. And they just cast so far, they've gone, I want one, you know, they bought it. And it's just amazing. So sometimes you can pay £300 for a Ziplex, you can't bend it, you think you've got a good rod, but you haven't really because you can't use it. I've always said this when I used to do talks. With that Colmic rod, you'll get it, you'll bend it, and you'll use it, and you'll get every bit out of it. It's almost like a giant catapult. So that, that's the big difference. With the Ziplexes, they're very tippy, and you've got to wind them up. And unless you're pretty good, you sometimes pay a lot of money for what I used to say about 18 inches of fishing rod. For when I used to do a talk, I used to start off, and the first thing I'd say is, look, Will you pay me for this bit of this rod? We give me 250 quid for this little bit on the end here. And they go, no. I said, well, that's probably, I don't want to upset you here, but probably what most of you lot are bending. And you're paying 250 quid for 18 inches of rod. And you wouldn't do it. And they said, no. I said, well, if you get a rod that's more progressive, all the rods I've designed for Shimano and Daiwa and Grays, and I've, I've designed for Penn and all of them, I've always made sure they're, they'll cast easily. And if you talk to anyone, about the few of the rods I've designed, the Penn Viper, the BTB Daiwa, they're all very forgiving and guys have picked them up, cast miles and all still now they say, oh, I've got one of your BTB Daiwas, they're fantastic because they can use it, that's the big difference and uh, Ziplex, I don't, I talked to Terry and I, he's not going to tell you this but I don't, I'm not quite sure where they could make a rod as finesse as this, you know, to be honest with you because they are pretty special, I'm not challenging him to do one I think he's kept out of it, his conventional rods are marvellous, his M4s and everything, they're brilliant. So I still think there's a room in it for, you know, you've got the normal rod, the conventional what I call it, and then you've got the light, the 15 footer, which is the light three piece, which I think 
is good until you come up to a lot of weed and Dungeness and things like that. So I think you've got to have one of each is the answer. Instead of all this going one way or the other, if you can master it that you've got one rod of each type, then when the going gets tough and you get the weed and the everything, you can just throw the fixed ball one away and you can just chuck your multiplier out with the um, normal gear with the conventional rod, which has got a lot more power, you know? Back in late 1999, I was asked by one of the magazines to nominate what I saw was the biggest single contribution to sea angling during the 20th century. An easy question for me to answer, a no-brainer in fact. Without hesitation, I nominated uptide fishing. Not only did it produce more fish in difficult shallow water situations, it also forced anglers to scale down and enjoy the fishing more. On top of which, it spawned a whole new era in rod design and manufacturing, with every company worth its salt getting in on the act. So let me now put the same question to you, but let's split the answer across boat and shore. What do you think has made the biggest contribution to both boat and shore fishing throughout your time in the trade? Unfortunately I've already said it, but I think it's the impact lead. Before that you had the impact shield. It's just a thing of clipping down, it was in the way, but the impact leads are just marvellous because it just clips on the lead, it enables you to cast further, it's just phenomenal. And, and maybe the only other thing I think is marvellous, and not everyone knows about this, but most people do now. When I was oh, 20 years ago, I made rig wallets for companies and we used to put their name of their shop on them, Hastings Angling Centre, Maidstone Angling Centre. We used to make hundreds of rig wallets, and you know how popular rig wallets were. Well, now it's all winders. And the guys all use winders now from Tronics. You wind all your rigs on there, they're perfect. You've got a little winder box which costs you about 11 quid. And that's got to be the most innovative thing made because when you put them in there, you label them all up if you're a match angler with what they are. So you quickly pick out which rig you want. Everything's sort of at your fingertips, it's really good. And I just think they're marvellous, the winders. I mean, we just don't stop selling them. I think if I'd have had C Match going, that was the kind of thing I would have developed by now, you know. we still got a C-Match company going, but when you develop something, it costs you a lot of money, and I've just spent a lot of money on these sidewinders, which I think, again, surely the most innovative thing in boat fishing has got to be a sidewinder, because they've just took over from red gills. They're just marvellous, aren't they? And they catch so well. So that's probably, in boat fishing, that's probably the, the best thing that's ever come out. Apart from, which I've already said before, the number one has got to be braid. And, and braid for shore fishing it enables you, you to cast further it's quite strong you can go right down to 10 pound with it which you wouldn't believe and the same in the boats when you go out there um, places like Eastbourne here you haven't got to use half the amount of lead so you've got much more pleasure in your fishing so it's superb so I think basically that they're the two main things I would say braid and then the impact lead the amnesia which I run through before it has to be said that most tackle dealers are a source of more than simply what they stock in the shop. They also get to hear a lot of stuff from customers, which puts them in a position to advise on trends, marks and tactics on a changing basis. A valuable resource which, if people just nip in for a few swivels and a chat, then buy all the major items off the internet, is going to be lost and very sadly missed. How then do you see the threat of internet selling, and what can be done to combat it? Well, I think you've got to have good bait. The only thing saving the tackle shops is bait. You want good service and plenty of knowledge. And I think if you've got plenty of knowledge and you're fishing and active, people will come to you. And at least if you can uh, match the price. Or I had a guy the other day and I said, look, I can't be doing that, but I'll, I can do it for 10 quid more. And he looked at me and he said, that's a deal. Fair enough, you and me. And some people will come to you. People are mercenary, they look for the cheapest, we all do it. But like a guy the other week, I sold him a £590 pole, roach pole from Preston Innovations. And he's coming in and I don't think I've sold a roach pole in here for about eight years. But he said to me, Tony, I don't do match fishing really, you know. I want this pole and I said, look, I won't be able to match their silly prices. He said, yeah, but Tony, I want to buy it off you. And because he knows me and I put him right on some other stuff. I said, right, I said, well, I can do 570 he said, I can get it 5.30 on the net, right? And I said, well, I can't do it, Mark. 5.70 is it. And uh, he turned around and he said, right, just order it. Here's the money. We got it next day. He's a happy customer. And he's got backup. You know, if something goes wrong, he can walk in here and we'll sort it out. 
I know you got back up on the net, don't get me wrong, but he's got full back up and he comes to me, he shops all the time. And I said to him today, he wants another rod now. And I said, look, I, I couldn't help you on the pole, I'll help you a little bit on the next rod. And if everyone was like him, I'd be millionaire. But you know, unfortunately, we all do it, we look for the cheapest, don't we? And it, I'm afraid the internet has just killed lots of mail order businesses, I think. Basically, I think the good shops will survive and the bad shops will go. It's sad really though, because I say the good shops, the more you put into it, the more you get out of it, but it's really getting tough, you know. I mean, if it wasn't for the bait side, I think a lot of shops would be gone, you know. But it, it's really working out that you've got top angling shops and they're trying hard to make it work, but it's all a struggle, you know. The internet, as you know, is the way to go. But I think the ones that are really, and I think you've got to find your own niche, you know. You've got to find um, find sort of things like, I, I don't know, like I've found these Colmic rods. I've got them. It's a niche. You're not going to get Sports Direct or someone like that selling Colmic rods. You know, and all these big dealers that buy all this gear in. It, it's, a, it's a specialist market. I think you've got to find the specialist market and try and aim at that. Because if you find the specialist market, no one else can get it. So if you get into the thing where, I don't know, let's just say everybody's got a cheap packet of sidewinders and there's millions of them, you can buy them on the net. Whereas if you sort of specialise in the best ones, you might get a better chance. Though you're not active these days in angling journalism, let me take that last question one step further. How do you see the future delivery of angling information going? Will magazines eventually stop publishing and carry large-scale ads like yours on printed paper? They're just about surviving, but only by the skin of their teeth. I don't know, it's going to be, I suppose, time will tell, won't it? I mean, we have come through the recession, haven't we? At least we've got through that. I don't know about the big shops, and also, like you're saying about the magazines, they're fighting each other now. Something's got to give, isn't it? Well, this next question might help shed a little bit more light here. Based purely on tackle sales now, how do you see the future of sea angling from both the boat and the shore going? Because for my money, there simply aren't enough new recruits coming along to keep both the magazine as well as the tackle industry healthy. We're trying things, we've got things like, um, we did Fish for Kids, try to get the kids involved. And that was backed by pure fishing pretty well, you know, give rods out and everything and they've got all these kids fishing which was marvellous. And that was a good thing. We did um, a cast intuition day, which was marvellous. And uh, Julian Shambrook come down, he was casting and showing everyone what to do, brought all these rods down. Uh, we displayed them all and we sold some, you know, on the day, we took some orders. I think you've just got to keep trying to push it. I think what they've done is kids are just on computers all day long. One of the things I'm very anti, and I could get in a bit of trouble for this, but this is me, it's gone quiet at the moment, they're talking about a fishing licence for sea fishing. Now, that's all very well, and I know Alan Yates is behind it and certain people. Now, I'm a great believer in putting stuff in. Now, if there was a licence and they make mini reefs and they do this and they do that, that's all good. But as you know, Phil, that won't happen, okay? If they ever did have a sea fishing licence, I think I'd close this door as quick as I could. Because I think the only thing you've got left is mackerel on the beach and kids. And when the mackerel come in, Dad takes his boy down there, and then his boy buys a rod, then his boy buys a reel, then Dad gets keen and he buys a rod. And it all starts from mackerel fishing, around about this time, July, August. And that gets them down there and it gets them out off the bloody streets, you hear me? Now they start putting a licence out there, now they will not go and pay 10 or 12 quid for a licence to go down the beach. It will never happen. So I think the whole thing will get killed if that happens. So I'm on one side in the way of conservation, if they're going to do anything, but the other side, and I feel really strongly about this because they were talking about it a couple of years ago, you know, I actually got onto Southern News. I was fuming, you know, I wanted to say my point. Because it, it, we're struggling as it is, and I'll tell you what, if there's no children going fishing, you've had it. And it's bad enough now because they've got these big factory ships now that they've bought up in Scotland and everywhere and they've absolutely hoovered these mackerel up and it, I don't know if it's like down your way but it's a real struggle getting mackerel down here at the moment and it, that's because they're getting so many 
well at the end of the day that is reflecting you know I mean I normally sell this time of year thousands and thousands of feathers we've had some mackerel on the beach but very few this year they've even been scarce in the boats and all right there's two sides of the coin maybe they could say oh if we put this money into a license we could stop it it won't stop will it you know that so basically the only bit of life you've got left is a bit of this kind of fishing for kids and even if dad takes his son in the summer and he takes him down there fishing he won't go and pay a license to do it I tell you it won't happen because you know it's all money again isn't it it's almost like another tax you know and I think it's really bad and I'm, it's the only thing I really feel strong about that they shouldn't do it and fortunately maybe I shouldn't mention it because it's gone very quiet now for a couple of years but they have mentioned it a few times and you just go into a black hole then it's disappeared and you know my main gripe is all these the foreign trawlers coming over here they've cleaned out where they live because I've been over there and they, every little fish on them slabs in France and all over abroad they're mini fish aren't they they've got soles there about six inches long and everything even smaller well we've got a nice bit of fish left here and they're just going to destroy it if they keep letting them in and I, I heard the other week down I did a this move round thing and they're a bit scarce this year these smooth rounds at Celsius and then a week before I went I heard that there was a thousand washed up on the Isle of Wight and they reckon a big trawler from abroad got them and skinned them all and they're selling them as robbing us you know whereas we put them all back and then someone comes in and takes thousands of them because they, they all show up there's millions of them when they're about and so that's depleted their stocks you know it's pretty sad but I think sea anglers will survive they seem to survive forever but the thing is companies like that though if it's not doing very well they'll pull the plug on it you know that don't you so you can say it'll survive but if Bauer decide this one isn't working they'll pull, they won't care whether it's a sea angler magazine they'll just pull the plug on it won't they no one's safe nowadays are they <laughs> for many years now Tony's tackle has been seen as a big player on the salt water scene what a lot of people fail to realise is that not only do you sell carp tackle, but that you've also played a big role in certain aspects of freshwater fishing, more of which as we go along. So let me re-ask one of my earlier questions now with regard to the freshwater scene. What, if any, patterns have you picked up on there? I gave up sea fishing for about 10 years and I went carp fishing. And a mate of mine, Mick Hinson, he's really good. And we paired up, we'd done the British Championships a few times, got in the final and everything. And then uh, we went to the World Carp Championship, 2004 it was. And uh, there was over 300 people there. And we won it. <laughs> we, we won 10 grand. Uh, we went to France first time. And what we won it with really was sheer distance. We caught 11 carp. And everyone else on the lake, you had Frank Warwick there, all the top anglers, you know what I mean? Tim Paisley, they're all there, you know, everyone who's anyone named was there. And we, we managed to cast out a long way and spot out a long spot out distance with bait to an exact little spot. And my mate is good at it, you know, really good. And we put that bait on there, it was there a week. And we, we not just won it, I mean, to be honest, we didn't have the best peg on the lake. The lake's fast. We caught them at range. We had 11, I think the next, as a Welsh pair had two carp. And then a couple of other people had one fish and that was how tough it was. We absolutely annihilated everyone, it was all distance. It's not casting distance, it's feeding at distance. You know, when they go on these lakes and they spot, I've watched them, and they put this spot out, which puts the bait out, and these spawn things, which are the latest thing in carp fishing, which is one of the best things ever. I'll come back to that in a minute. And they put it all over the place, you and me. Whereas Mick, he'll put it out, and it, if that's where it's gonna land, you know, it's gonna land there every time. He'll clip it, he'll make sure it's perfect. And one of the biggest things I've seen that come out in carp fishing is this thing called a spawn. Now, I don't know if you've seen the calder videos, but they have a spod where they fill it up full of sweet corn and hemp and uh, pellets. And you fire it out, but what happens with a spod is half it falls out going halfway out. This spawn is like a little bait capsule. You put all your bait in it and it doesn't open. It, it's a very much like an impact lid. It doesn't open until it hits the water. So everything comes out. As, as it hits the water so you're putting it all in one area which is big they do spray about baits I notice that some people do fish in an area and they'll spray baits about to keep the carp in the area but in general I found with Mick and that and we won this 10 grand this 2000 
the four World Cup Championships and basically we, we won it through being precise and then we both went on to fish for England carp fishing and when we'd done that we both caught a fish on the lake and no one there was, there was nobody else caught on the whole lake there was one more fish and they had a second part of it was down the river in France it's England against France we won and the second part was down the river and we were the only ones who caught out of everyone on the lake and uh, we both had a fish each it was all precise stuff, you know, it was actually, it was actually fishing exactly the same spot, we marked it all out, we went out in a boat and this isn't a, a boat where you take it out remote control, we went out properly in a boat and sounded it all up where we were going to fish and everything, you with me? And it was all precise stuff, getting that, that lead in the right place. And me and him caught, cool. we were heroes, you know? And uh, I remember we got drunk, we won a load of stuff and we left it in the corner for the kids, which was quite nice. That's another thing that people should do. I mean, we won a couple of brollies and a bivvy and a something else and it was an England thing. We didn't want it. We couldn't even be bothered to pick it up. And we said, just leave it. It was, it was with uh, Chilcott, I think. He's a top name, you know, and I said, just leave it there for the kids. And that was quite nice, really, you know. But it's, uh, it's putting a bit back into it, isn't it? But that spawn is the biggest thing in carp fishing. And I suppose it's all that now, I know, but the hair rig. Years ago, no one ever dreamed of a hair rig. I, I was trying to look up today to see who it was, and I, he was a friend of Kevin Maddox, and I cannot remember. If you look on the internet, you'll get his name. And the guy who invented that hair rig was a legend, because everyone now who fishes for carp, he fish with a hair rig, and that's it. And it's marvellous, really, I mean, because they realise that the carp suck it in and then blow it out, and of course, with a hair rig, they don't feel the line, they don't feel anything. So that's one of the big innovations, and then now they do all these chod rigs which just sit up off the bottom and they reckon the carp sucks it in and they can't get it out. It's, they shake it and it can't get it out of their mouth, so it hooks them immediately. But uh, I'm a bit behind now because after we won the World Championship, we went and fished for England in France, and then I think it's about 2006, I went back into sea fishing and I got out of it completely. So I basically sort of went back to sea fishing, what I know, and I've been doing well, won a quite a lot. I won quite a lot of things since I've come back. I won a lot of things, but I did it before, you know. So it's quite nice, you know, but uh, definitely in the carping, I'd think that, and the other thing you've got is a marker float now. The first thing you do when you get to a lake, get the marker float out. Once again, back comes the old braid. It goes back to braid on the reel, and you can feel the bottom, and you just chuck it out and keep chuck it out and see if we can find some feature you know like a little bit of gravel something like that and they'll feed off the hard ground and that's the first thing you want to do when you get to any lake and just get the marker out first don't bother about anything else and just have a good old mark round see if we can find a bit of good ground or something like that and that'll reap your rewards because once you start feeding on the right place you're going to get fish the watercrafts is the most important thing I've noticed because people tend to just crash in and think this is it I'll chuck this out I'll put a big load of bay out there my mate Mick we used to sit there when we got there he used to sit there sometimes for 20 minutes just looking at the water just getting an idea of what you're going to do before you do it and we spend a lot of time doing that and I found that reaps big rewards in purely business terms would it be fair to say that these days carp fishing is the glue that holds most of course fishing together I think so but then that's because I don't do a lot of match fishing tackle so I find that, you know, I've got a good carp fraternity now, I've, get, I've built up all my carp side and I'm starting to get people in. And it's very trendy, it's lovely to go carp fish, I just come back from France last week. You know, you stick your rods in, you can have a chat, you can have a couple of beers or whatever, talk to your mate. It's really sociable, I've found it's brilliant. Some people say, oh, what do you want to sit there and wait for a fish for? But in some ways it's better, because you kind of get the other situation where I go match fishing, I'm like a nutter, you know, I'm running around and doing this and doing that and doing this, whereas you've still got to do your feeding for carp, but after you've got everything out there and you've got it right, then you just keep putting it in the same spot and keep, it's all about little and often, keep that feed going in slowly and it'll reap rewards, you know, and I've sort of seemed to do fairly well, I go and you learn a lot, I mean, I learned a lot of my mate Mick Hinson who, in that carp thing, he's brilliant and me and him just work together well because he caught more fish than me, but he'd always take the hot spot, but I didn't mind. We fished together as a pair, you see, and he'd take the, where the fish were. But I didn't mind that, because I was quite happy to scratch about.
and that's the way we worked it together. I mean, on, on the British Championship thing, I, he caught ten fish. I only caught one, about twenty five, twenty eight pound carp. But I see this carp come up out the water, and you throw at them. I don't know if you know this, but I see it and it put its head up and I threw straight at it. And that was the only carp in my swim all weekend. So that's the kind of thing you look for in a lake. You see these fish. So if they jump out, you take no notice. But when they lock their heads over, they're feeding. And if you see a carp on a lake, it lops his head over. And he just comes out of the water and just glides over. He's cleaning out his gills. So he's feeding down there, you and me. He, he might even be just scuffing up all the bottom, but he's in there looking for food. So if you can get somewhere near it, and I, I've done that quite a few times. I've chucked at fish and caught them. And within about 20 minutes, you catch it. Because they're feeding there, you know. And a lot of people don't realise that. It's quite incredible, really. Just while we're on the thing, I'll try and finish this off here, but when I won the World Championship 2004, I got on a plane about three weeks later with Alan Yates and went to Gambia. I fished the Gambia on the beach. And I got on a plane and I was just like, well, World Championship, you can't believe it, can you? I was, I was over the moon. Anyway, we got on the plane and me and Alan started having a laugh and that, and it, he kept saying to everyone, oh dear. And I, I said, what's... I didn't know, and he's going, oh dear, this is dangerous. And, I said, what? You know, he said, I didn't say what. People were saying, my missus said, what, what do you mean? Oh, Christ, you won't beat him. And she, he started saying this to uh, my wife and that. And I didn't know. And I was just on such a high. Anyway, I went out there the week after and I won the Gambia. I won seven grand in the Gambia. And I just was on such a high that you get on a thing where I'm, I can't be beaten. And he knew, as an angler, he knew. It's hard to explain if you're not. But he knew I was going to do the business in Gambia. And I had on the last day I had Alan Yates and Richard each side of me and I'll tell you what nine times out of ten they beat me because they are professional they're really good and I just blew them away because it was my time you and me and I think confidence is a great thing in match angling if you ever go match angling uh, if you've got the confidence to do it and think you're going to win you tend to somehow do a lot better and confidence is a big thing in fishing isn't it and a lot of people they rule it out they don't understand it they think what are you talking about so, you fished for England on the carp scene, but did you ever get to represent us on the sea angling scene as well? Yeah, I fished for England with Alan Yates, uh, 19... I think it was 1981. Uh, I was 24 anyway, I'm 60 now. I think it was around about 81. And I went to South Africa with Alan Yates, and there was just five of us, we got picked for England. And uh, we went out there, and I caught sharks and everything and it was brilliant but I kind of done okay but I wasn't experienced enough and I got drunk, I was young, I used to go out get drunk, have a few beers and I wasn't at it properly, you and me. I tried my hardest but it was really tough, he was getting up at five in the morning, I was going out with the lads at night having a nice time and I was young you know and I was out there on my own and I could have done a bit better I think but I went back five years later and I'd done it again, I fished again and I think I won the individual come second and the second time and our B team beat the A team and we had a marvellous time the second time but I'd learnt, see, once again I'd learnt a bit about it you need to learn the first time I went, I went in blind the second time I knew what I was doing I knew what I was going to do, you know, and I was a bit older then but I fished on them two occasions and uh, I was quite proud to be honest with you but uh, that was enough for me I, I, I don't want to get too personal, but my wife died about 20 years ago now, and uh, she died very suddenly, she had a brain hemorrhage, and uh, I gave up fishing completely for 11 years, and then that's when I just played, I went to the Gambia, I went there 10 times, and I got lots of results and won a lot of money out there, but I didn't go match fishing here, I didn't really do anything, and then I started with Mick about 2003, carping, and then after that I finished the carp bit, I got back to my roots and now I love it again, I'm back into the swing of the match fishing, I love it. I'm president of the local club here and the nomads and I sort of helped run it and everything and it's really nice to be back, you know. But it was just devastating for about five years I went mad because <laughs> I just, I was left with the kids 11 and 12 on my own and I basically lost my way a bit. And then uh, I got myself sorted out and I'm married again now and everything's good. But, uh, you know, it's one of the times in my life where it's pretty sad, but so la vie, eh? <laughs> Final question. Based on the various trends of the past, how do you see fishing, tackle development and the tackle trade evolving in the future? 
I think it will always get better. I don't know where it's coming from. <laughs> but it's like everything, isn't it? You, you watch it and they bring out a bed chair for carp fishing. And now they bring out a bed chair that's made of air light material and it's twice as light as anything else. Digital scales. No one really noticed, they creeped in, didn't they? All the scales were always normal. They went digital, now there's loads of digital scales and it's just taken for granted, isn't it? So I think things will always improve. Tackle just gets better and better. And I, one thing I do think will happen, and a lot, a lot of people have missed out on this. When they first started developing stuff in Japan, it was very cheap, and it was made in Hong Kong, and it was cheap, and it was this and that, and uh, there was stuff from Hong Kong that was cheap, there was stuff here that's cheap, and everything. And then Japan was fairly cheap, and then all of a sudden it changed, and then it became the best. And Japanese is probably the best tackle in the world. Mega expensive. Well, I can see this. I can. I see it already, Phil. You buy something. Uh, I'll give you an idea. Carp set of alarms, right? And I bought them four years ago off this guy. And every other week, a bloke comes in. You duck your head, and he's bought set in, and there's one not working. You know, he's got a receiver system, and they only cost him seventy quid, but they're not working. You know, so no problem. The guy who supplied them to me, fantastic. Now there's another set. Two months later. Oh mate, this has gone wrong again. All right, okay. Anyway, cut a long story short, what I'm trying to get to here is that two years later now, I'll sell a set of these alarms and you just never see them again. I think I sold 50 sets at the big one at uh, Farnborough. Never had a phone call. <laughs> the year before, I had five, six phone calls. Oh, my receiver's not picking up. This isn't working, this isn't working. Replaced them all. But what a lot of people don't realise is these they don't want that back. So they go, right, what's happening here? It's the blue light. The bulb keeps going on it. Right, so we've got to sort that. So the next lot in, the blue light's sorted, or whatever it be. It might be a reel where the back wine goes or something, but they're not, they don't want it back to China. So what they do is they improve. So I think you're going to find that China's going to become a um, dope people say, oh, it's old Chinese. It's the business now. It already is already. The reels that are made in China now are top notch, you with me? And already now it's showing, and uh, I think it'll show through even more as time goes on. First of all, it was all rubbish, got to buy British and all that, but we haven't got the amount of. We've got the ability, you've got your Ziplex, which is number one, you know, you've still got your, your good companies that do things, but on general, if these Chinese get hold of something, they copy it, it might be rubbish the first time, but the second lot in a good. And you can't fool it, and I think that's the way it's going to go. In the way of um, developments, I don't know, they might develop these boats a bit more. I mean, you know, they use all these boats for car, I'll manti these a little bit because they're marvellous things, but that's taking all the skill out of the fishing, isn't it? Bait boats. <laughs> all your skill's gone. I'd pick a bush and try and get it underneath it, and then I'll perhaps clip it to it so I'll get it there again on the, on the reel and all that. But that's all gone. You've got a bait boat, put your bait under there, it's all done. So it's really killed it a bit, although they're marvellous things and of course maybe I shouldn't knock it because I'll sell them in the shop. I, I don't really know, I can't see anything spectacular coming along other than the most spectacular thing I've seen is this comic beach rods and some of the other Italian ones, they're just out of this world. You say what's going to come along, you don't know, but that's the biggest revelation It started about a year and a half ago that I've seen in 40 years because it, it's almost like a carp rod. It's thinner than a carp, but it's like a match rod, you know, a freshwater match rod. It's almost like that, and if you see one, you just you just won't believe it. And most people, I've had people come in here and they pick them up, and they go, oh, you can't afford that, it's 450 quid, not nastily. And within about four days, I've come in here and gone, I want it. And it's the kind of thing you get in your hand, and you think, I want one of these, you with me? So it's that kind of thing, so. I think we've pretty much done the tackle trade side of things full justice now. In part two, I'd like to look in a little more detail at the practical side of your carp and saltwater fishing. But for now, it's a very big thank you to Tony Kerridge, with the promise that we will be back. <laughs>